We had light bulb moment when yeah. we were cooking bacon on the stove and Esther's five pounds at our feet waiting for something to fall off of the stove. And I just was like, oh my gosh, like I just, it just happened. It was like this, Can't do this. bulb, it, like it just, it was, it was a crazy moment. And we never ate meat after that point. One of the worst practices ever developed on the planet was his consumption of other animals for food and using them for resources. These things happen behind walls and these dark, horrible, stinky places where no one's allowed to enter. I think people would not participate in violence against these animals if they saw the animals firsthand. I have no doubt about it. Nothing serious is going to change until there's a, a, just a catastrophe that forces us to change, that we just realize that we're killing the planet. There is a vision of the future that doesn't include the exploitation of animals. Die Wachstumsraten sind so hoch wie in keiner Branche. Selbst Hightech und so kann mit uns im Moment nicht mithalten. Das ist nicht nur ein Markt, das ist nicht nur irgendwas kurzfristiges. Jeder Fleischproduzent hat ein veganes Regal rausgeschoben. Guck mal, ich kann jetzt auch vegan. Plant-based diets could reduce greenhouse gas emissions of up to two thirds and eight million lives could be saved. Sanctuaries provide a sort of aspiration to the kind of world we could create. Da ist jemand, jemand, der leben will. This is the social justice movement of our times. It affects the most number of beings. The initial goal is bringing as many non-human animals from the side of the things to the side of the persons. Instead of domesticating animals, we're domesticating cells. How could I choose something that came from a slaughtered animal if, the, if what my experience is is the same? I think it will eradicate traditional livestock and meat production. Hi everyone, it's Robbie here. Really, really excited to introduce you to Mr. Mark Piachel, the director of the new film, uh, The End of Meat. We're really excited to talk about the launch of the film. It's happening here in the UK fairly soon, and we're gonna go in and ask a bunch of questions and learn more about the film and Mark's motivations for making the film, his history and everything else. Welcome, Mark. Oh, thanks for having me. So before we start talking about the film and your history and, and being a filmmaker, let's talk about your history as a vegan. Like, how did you get into the movement and, and what was your vegan journey? Okay, so I went vegetarian when I was 17. And then back then it was a bit harder to find out all these things, how uh, animal products are being produced, basically. So um <clears throat> it was hard to get that information and then a couple of years later i watched the documentary called baraka mm -hmm. beautiful film yeah love it and there's a scene where they're debeaking chicks and they're sorting the male into female chicks and that just got me thinking and i did some more research which was a bit harder because the internet wasn't there and information wasn't readily available but I looked into it and I decided to go vegan. How have things changed in all these years that you've been vegan? I was, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, you've seen a massive shift in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was difficult uh, being vegan at that time. It was around 2000 in Germany, so it was hard to get all these products. Um, there were some, but I think my first tofu was in a glass and I, wow. didn't, I had no <laughs> idea how to prepare it. So I was like, oh, this is... This is not very tasty, but right. uh, compared to now, it's, it's just so much easier now. There's such a variety of foods and there's so many cookbooks. It's so easy to look all this information up and it makes it way easier for people to start now. Absolutely. And Germany's definitely leading the way. I've been to Berlin a few times and then you throw a stone and you hit a vegan cafe or um, a vegan restaurant. It's really inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's something we look at in the film as well, just how this um, shift has happened in Berlin and how it changed so quickly from uh, this term veganism that was known to almost uh, no one before. And now it's like entered the mainstream and people mm -hmm. are talking about it all the time. And the film itself, do you want to give us the audience a bit of a background as to how the film came about and what was, you know, what was the kind of like the spark that, that brought the film to life? 
Sure. So the idea was to explore how the world would look like if we stopped eating meat and animal products. And the idea um, came about when I was doing interviews for my previous film, Live and Let Live. And I always always asked the question what people <coughs> would think the world would look like in 20 years from now. And I got some really interesting answers. And then when um, the whole vegan idea took off in Germany about eight years ago, I thought maybe this is more than just a trend. Maybe this is the beginning of a larger movement. And that got me starting the film. And was this um, something that you did on your own or were there people around you that were encouraging you to do it? Was it kind of like one of those aha moments? <clears throat> yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to friends about this idea and how there isn't really a perspective how a world, how a vegan world would actually look like. And there hasn't been done much, much research. So I thought it was really interesting to follow this as a documentary idea subject. And you're an author as well. Um, tell us a little bit about the books that you've written. Sure. So I uh, wrote a cookbook in 2000 that was released in 2007, which is called Vegan Lecker Lecker, which is it's like one of the first vegan cookbooks in Germany. And it sold really well. And then it was just basically all my favorite recipes and I put them together in this little book. So um, and I seemed to resonate with people. And then um, three years later, I wrote a basic introduction guide to veganism for for new vegans like talking about the ethics, how to go vegan, things to avoid, things to look look out for, labels and all that stuff. And yeah, that's been selling really well as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and the film premiered um, last month in New York, is that right? Uh, that was the US premiere. We had the Berlin premiere last year and it was released in German theaters in September last year. And how have people been responding to the film so far? Yeah, it's been really positive. Um, we've got lots of great feedback. People really seem to like that change of perspective, that it's a bit more positive outlook in the future and just uh, trying to imagine how a world like this could look like. And the premiere is here on October 5th in uh, the UK at uh, View in Piccadilly. So if you're watching and you're in London, make sure you're there. Are there any tickets left? Uh, no, it's sold out. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's, it's part of the Rain Dance Film Festival, right. and there's another screening on October 4th at 3 p.m. That's okay. There's still some tickets available. Okay, brilliant. Well, I'll put the links in the description for everyone if you want to uh, purchase a ticket. So let's dive into the film, and let's just tell us about the kind of the narrative and the kind of the main things that you're trying to get across in this film when people watch it. Sure. So um, we start with a bit of background, a bit of history on meat consumption, meat production, and... Um, just as an introduction for people who mm -hmm. don't know History, yeah. that much about it. Yeah, and then we talk about talk to um, undercover journalists. We talk to Joanne MacArthur. She's amazing. Yeah, and we talk to Timothy Patcheret, who wrote a, who went undercover in a slaughterhouse and wrote a book called um, Every 12 Seconds. And talk to Anita Crimes, um, who started Toronto Pick Save, and just uh, trying to get a, a picture of how this industry looks like and what uh, the activists are discovering when they went undercover or when they do these kinds of activism. Mm -hmm. So we follow that and then we go to uh, Germany ha and kind of look back how this trend started, how it affected um, the early pioneers of the movement like the Vegans and Tofu Town, two larger uh, vegan companies in Germany. And then we also went to the largest um, meat fair in Frankfurt and talk to people there and we see that veganism is a subject there as well and mm -hmm. then we move to health and environment and then <clears throat> um, talk to um, people that are envisioning how a world like this would look like so people who are running sanctuaries artists philosophers will kimlick and sue donaldson who wrote the book zupolis for example which just really has been a huge influence to the film and um and finally, the last chapter is uh, biotech or cultured meat, clean meat, and all kinds of different approaches to producing the products, the animal products we know without the animals. Incredible. And obviously, like cultured meat features in the film. Um, there's so many companies and organizations now that are springing up in this race, you could say, to, to get these products to market. In your kind of research and connecting with these people, how far away do you think we are from, you know, a world that is fed by cultured meat? Well, when I started the film, 
they said it was about five years until it would hit the market. And then when we finished the film until now, there's even more companies that have started researching and working on this. So we have Hampton Creek, which is now called Just in the US, and they've announced a product for this year. Mm -hmm. So wow. I don't know how realistic that mm -hmm. is, but um, there's, there's still regulations that have to be passed in the US before it can enter the market. And that seems to be a bit more difficult at the moment. But yeah, I think um, it's going to happen soon because so many companies are working on it and they have such, such huge investments. So I think we're going to see it rather sooner than later. And what's quite interesting is obviously these products pose quite uh, a viable alternative, a cheaper, a healthier, a more environment, environmentally friendly alternative to what some call land meat, or, you know, meat from animals. Industry, uh, the animal agriculture industry is a multi-trillion pound, multi-trillion dollar industry worldwide. Um, they're pushing back. They're starting to kind of, you know, try and challenge these products by, try, you know, trying to change laws like they have in Europe, not allowing plant milks to be called milk. They don't want these products to be called meat. Do you think <laughs> industry is so powerful, I guess, is the question. You know, do you think they're going to try and stop this movement of clean meat? Um, that's That was something I thought as well. But then we've seen companies like Tyson Foods in the US mm -hmm. or there's a large... Uh, there's a large meat producer in Germany who have all invested in um, in cultured meat. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're seeing that there's a slow change and they're, they're seeing that this new emerging technology can change their traditional mo mm -hmm. model of producing meat. So I think that it's more the farmers who are scared right now because they're going to lose their jobs or this is going to change radically for them. Mm -hmm. But I think the companies um, who are also in Germany are are, um, have uh, released vegan and vegetarian products. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Rügenwalder Mühle, which is like the largest sausage producer in Germany, they are now um, uh, have like 33% of their um, uh, revenues are made through uh, vegetarian and vegan products, wow. which is like a huge number. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think it's slowly shifting and I think meat companies are also shifting towards that direction. And obviously, if this happens and we successfully get the world off animal agriculture, what kind of like, wh how do we see the world changing? Because that's the question, isn't it? That's like, what if we stopped eating meat? That's the question you ask in your film, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very broad question. So um, obviously there's, there's a different, <laughs> there's so many perspectives to look at. And I think regarding numbers, one interesting study was done by the Oxford Martin School in 2016 and they say that a vegan diet globally could avert 8 million deaths by 2050, uh, cut greenhouse gas emissions by the food sector about two-thirds and save 1.5 trillion US dollars in climate uh, damages and healthcare related expenditures. So it would of course be huge, huge savings for, for uh, like on an economic side. And of course, this is really crucial because there's going to be 10 billion people by 2050. So we have to look at some kind of options. No, absolutely. I think, you know, when you lay the numbers out and you look at all the, the data, it just makes sense, doesn't it? And this is yeah. what our job is as filmmakers and creatives and activists and advocates is to take all this information, all these really dry and boring studies and turn them into creative, interesting, engaging pieces of content. So the masses can look at it or the governments and organizations can look at it and think, oh, wow, actually, you know, these people are right. They're not we're not just crazy, you know, tree hugging, um, mung bean money. <laughs> hippies we're actually people who really care about the future and we want to see uh, you know a kind of healthier happier world <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah and um we also looked at what kind of um incentives governments can can take or uh, make available so like food labeling or taxing foods based on their ecological footprints those are some ways and then you know making um foods or vegetarian vegan alternatives more readily available for a larger um, percentage of the population. Now, obviously, part of part of the expansion of this movement um, is, um, is it's all connected to food. Now, you said things have been growing in Germany rapidly with a lot of meat companies taking on vegetarian and vegan products. Do you see that trend continuing? 
worldwide? I mean, because I assume you've traveled and you've experienced different cultures. So are you seeing that shift growing? Because obviously here in the West, we're very lucky. We're in our little bubble where veganism seems to be expanding, but there is a whole other world out there. I mean, do you, do you think the rest of the world is, is picking it up as well? Well, uh, we see the trend like in Germany growing to other countries as well across Europe. I think that's there's a slow growth happening there. But then again, we went to India to look at the situation there. And what we see is that the number of vegetarians is actually de uh, decreasing because uh, vegetarian is something that's been seen as very traditional. So the young generation, the millennials, they want to try meats and exotic meats. So that's obviously changing the situation a bit. And um, India is going to be the most populous country just in a few years. So it's going to have a huge effect on what's being consumed and what these uh, consumption choices have on other countries as well. So, but there's also um, groups that are working on um, informing the public. There's a huge vegan movement growing there as well. So we see that the um, <clears throat> shift is happening there as well, just not as fast as it is here probably. And, um, and the film kind of also features... Uh kind of all kinds of educated people and people in kind of the scientific world. How important do you think the role is of kind of the scientific part of our movement, like people who are looking at the data? Because obviously at the moment, you know, our movement is very much focused on animal rights and um, the emotional side of things. But when it comes to science, which is health and nutrition, like how important do you think is that part of the conversation? Good question. I think health is really important because what I've uh, learned uh, when I looked at the, the development in Germany, it was the health aspect that got veganism into the mainstream. Because we had, um, I think it was two, three scandals of where they found horse meat in lasagna. That was a big thing. And then there was this discussion happening and people um, started looking at veganism for like, a healthier option and then we saw the release of all these cookbooks and that was what got veganism into the mainstream and I think it wouldn't have been possible with just the ethical side. Absolutely. Uh, we find the same here at Plum Based News as well. A lot of the content that seems to engage people the most mm -hmm. is things to do with nutrition and health and fitness because I think it's a personal thing, isn't it? People feel a sense of connection with it because they read information, they learn about how these animal products can negatively affect their own bodies and their own health. Um, and it's, it's a lot easier for them to take it on because, you know, to be fair, not everyone cares about animals, not everyone cares about the future and the environment. So sort of helping people understand that shifting to this lifestyle can have a posit really positive effect on us as people. I think, like you say, it's a good way of hooking people in, drawing them in, and then kind of like, you know, secretly, not secretly, but kind of like getting in the animal ethics um, message yeah i think it's just like a gradual change when people get into this movement or get into the idea of veganism through health and they will automatically look at the ethical side as well and that's i think there's a study that uh, found that people shift to more the ethical side that's that's becoming more important to them once they look into it more i don't know if you're familiar with uh, Celeste rao have you heard of Celeste rao climate mm -hmm. healers no so Celeste, um has a program called um, Vegan 2020, 2026, where he believes that we must make a vegan world by 2026, as in we must end animal agriculture by 2026. And it's an interesting idea because he believes that if we don't do it after that, then we will have catastrophic shifts in our entire planet. Um, he talks about humans being these kind of like um, heat regulators of the planet. We've kind of, you know, with our lifestyle, with animal agriculture and industry, we've we've warmed the planet to the point where we've maintained it in its current state. So it's, it's we've avoided uh, the ice age, you know, the last ice age. Um, but, you know, animal agriculture is sort of taking us, what well, factory farming mostly is taking us like way over the line. Um, are there any numbers or ideas around, you know, how much time have we got left before we actually, because this is Celeste's is idea, but have, have you heard anyone talk about how much, how, you know, the clock, we're up against the clock, how much time have we got left really? <laughs> Ah, that's a good question. I think uh, there's there's a study I read that the peak meat, like the point where meat production is sustainable for the planet, is long is long past. We're long past that. So I think we're just going to see the consequences slowly building. Like in Germany, we see that with uh, the level of nitrate in in groundwater that's 
really pro a problem because of the uh, the feces of the uh, factory farm pr production is uh, growing and they don't know where to put it. And um, we see that through um, the problem with insects. There's uh, less and less insects, and that's because of the food production and the use of pesticides for growing feed crops for, for, for animals. And I think these are just two smaller examples for... Um, yeah, some some things that are going to happen in the future that are sh showing that these factory that fact factory farming and the consumption of animals is catastrophic and it's going to increase. And yeah, I, th I think it's up to governments and to leaders to implement larger changes. That it's not just um, these industries that can do what they want. Yeah, because it's a bit like a monster. Compassion and World Farming um, calls it the machine. They have this campaign where they talk about how the machine is just eating up and destroying everything. And it really is. It's kind of this monster that has, you know, perhaps at the time they thought it was a good idea to make more meat, more cheaper meat, more affordable animal products. But ultimately the people that conceived this, I think, were really um, deluded. Because I don't see how anyone could create a system like that that's so damaging and so cruel uh, without consequences. And, you know, as the Buddhists talk about, like, cause and effect and karma, you know, we've laid those stones down and, and now we're reaping the benefit on the benefits. We're reaping the, uh, the effects of those terrible decisions. Um, obviously, you know, things are changing so rapidly. I mean with everything you've experienced making this film and your life, I mean, do you see a vegan world? Do you do you feel that in your heart that it is possible? Well, when I started making the film, I was a bit more conservative about the idea. But then when I learned more about biotechnology and how fast these companies are growing and how far this idea has already progressed, that made me a bit more hopeful, I'd say, because I think when cultured meat enters the market at a price that is... Uh, competitive to regular produced meats right now, I think it will radically change the market. And that's, I think it's not just going to be vegans that are going to ch ch help us uh, shift. I think it's the flexitarians, the people that are actively reducing their meat consumption, because that's what's driving the growth of the plant-based meats and the cultured meats in the future. So I think that's really the key to helping people shift and change to a plant-based diet. Let's talk a little bit about animals themselves. Now, obviously, as vegans, we care about animals because we don't want to see them suffer for our pleasure. Why do you think it's so difficult for many people to see animals as individuals? Um, because ultimately, we grow up and we're brought up in a world where animals are not seen as individuals. They're seen as a commodity. I think it's just because of the separation, because people don't really have to deal with farmed animals anymore. I mean, it's a, it's a factory farm. It's People don't ever look into a factory farm and then they transport it to the slaughterhouse. So the only time people are going to see these animals is when they're on a transport truck somewhere on the road to the slaughterhouse. So I think there's this alienation from farmed animals and people don't really yeah, see them for what they really are. And then we have examples like Esther the Wonder Pig, which uh, is also in the film that radically changes people's perception because... You see this animal in this um, in this household, and together with dogs and cats, and you see that she isn't really any different from do dogs and cats. And that's, I think, examples like that help pe people change their perception, their um, yeah, view of farmed animals. Definitely, and um, you know, obviously, being an advocate, like, what are your thoughts on the the most effective ways we can advocate for animals? Because there's so many different ways in which we can do it. But, I mean, are there, in your opinion, more effective ways? Well, I think um, leading by example is probably the best the best way to go. I, I've, um, I've tried some different <laughs> approaches over the years, but I think that's that's what what works most effectively, that you, you uh, show people that this lifestyle really is nothing different if you... If you take a little time and get into the basics and the structure and yeah it's just so much more compassionate and when people see what their uh, consumption choices are or what's behind their consumption choice it, it really makes them afraid that they don't want to change and they also don't want to see the, the images from slaughterhouse and from factory farms or animal cruelty they're trying to avoid that so i think it really helps 
um, to be gentle in the approach and show them, okay, here, this is veganism. It tastes really good. It's available everywhere. So there's no need to hide from it. Amazing. And um, one of the things that we all struggle with on a daily basis is with seeing so much suffering. We are um, people who care as vegans. That's why we're vegan. We, we feel a compassionate connection with the earth and every creature on it from every fly to every bird you know we we want to treat all animals with respect and but sometimes when we see this suffering we see the way animals are treated you know and also our fellow human beings it's very difficult to remain positive and feel a sense of hope like how do you on a daily basis maintain a sense of hope that humanity is moving in the right direction oh uh, that's a good question i i mean i have to admit i live in a sort of a vegan bubble so and maybe that's necessary because if you really look at the numbers and you see trans animal transport trucks just driving past my office every day, so it's really hard not to become depressed about it because there's just so much suffering going on. And I think it's really important to focus on, yeah, this, just uh, the slow victories we've gained over the years. and that there is a hopeful future and that it helps people to um, yeah, look at the positive side. And that's something I've tried with the film as well because there's already so many documentaries that focus on the negative aspects of it. And I just wanted to show that there's a positive side to it all, the positive future of veganism and plant-based nutrition. And with human beings, um, you know, we, do you think, here's a question for you about us as people, as creatures, do you think compassion is innate within us or do you think that's something that we have to learn as people do you think we have to be taught it i think it's 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 something we grow up when we're uh, kids i mean i i certainly was compassionate towards animals when i grew up but then i learned that you know it's okay to eat these animals for example i grew up with rabbits my dad was a rabbit breeder so i used to play with the rabbits and then on sundays i used to eat them so and i thought okay this is just how it has to be and I never really questioned that until I was 17 so I think yeah education again is a is a very important part of it and I, um, I think um, trying um, to educate um, kids about this going to schools with school programs talking about veganism and our relationship to animals is something that's really helping a lot and uh, yeah I hope that's something that's being um, that we see more of in the future. At that age of 17, what, what shifted in your mind that kind of helped you see beyond the, the, the carnistic kind of like conditioning that you had? Um, so I grew up in a rural area, so it was hard to get exposed to new ideas. And then I got into punk rock music, <laughs> uh, political punk rock music. And that yeah. was something that when I read the lyrics, I was like, wow, there's all these ideas that I didn't know anything about and then I looked into it more and then I decided to go vegetarian. This is the incredible thing about art and music and culture and film and how it can inspire people to make changes in their lives. Um, if there are people out there who are watching who, who want to get involved in making films or creating art and as a, you know, as a creative person yourself, what, have you got any advice for people as to where to begin? Well, I don't have a, I have an, I don't have an education in filmmaking, so I'm, I'm a self-taught filmmaker, and I think it's just um, important that you, when you have an idea, you follow through with it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't make a movie just because you don't have a background. It's just, if you're passionate about something, then try to achieve it no matter at what cost. Um, I think it's easy technology is um, becoming more readily available it's more easier way more easier to make film than it was a couple of years back so uh, yeah are there any points in the film that really stand out to you that you feel like people you really want people to take away from that when they when they leave the cinema um, I think what uh, was also important in the film is uh, sanctuaries because we went to a few different sanctuaries in the US, Germany, and in the UK, and just to look at how farmed animals can live together with humans in the future. And I think it really helps people who are passionate about animals to go there and see 
animals not in like a factory farm or in a slaughterhouse but in an environment where they're happy and they can interact with other animals and live out their lives the way they are meant so i would say that yeah if you're an activist if you're passionate about animals go to a sanctuary and connect with the animals it really helps sustain your activism and it's yeah yeah amazing i mean we we um we know mark from friend animal sanctuary down in kent he's a wonderful man he's going to be at the q a here in london um tell us a little bit about mark and 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 their sanctuary um yeah it was it was nice to see mark again because uh the first i went to his sanctuary was in 2004 or 2005 i think and uh it was just so nice to go back and see how it had changed uh, in terms of the animals that there's so many more animals now and how he's caring for them and that there's um, all this like this new generation of people because back then it was more like the the older activists who were involved in animal rights activism and now there's all these young vegan activists who are doing the safe movement and anonymous for the voiceless and yeah it's just i thought it made me really hopeful that there's this new generation who are pushing this uh, movement so so much right now Right, it's been incredible. I mean, I've only been vegan for six years, so not that long, and I've seen things rapidly shift and change. I mean, what what do you think's driving this change so quickly? Um, are there any things that you've noticed that have kind of shifted it? Because you know, in the UK, we've gone from two hundred thousand vegans ten years ago to something like three point two million potentially now in the UK. Um, what do you think's caused this rapid increase? Well, I think probably the uh, the information age that um, information travels a lot faster through the use of the internet and we see that with groups like the safe movement who are doing vigils at transport trucks in front of the slaughterhouse and they take these images and they spread them so quickly through instagram and facebook and social media uh, so that's been a huge help and i think millennials they're more open to new ideas so they don't want to uh you know continue the tradition of their parents like uh, with uh, in terms of food and also in terms of where their food is being produced so they're asking more questions and they want more sustainable alternatives so i think that's what's really driving the movement millennials that are uh, open to these new ideas and they don't want to keep using or eating animals it's great it's so inspiring to see i mean every day I'm getting emails and messages from people, friends and family who I'd never think would go vegan or even consider it, who are, come to me and say, oh, you know that strange thing you do where you just eat plants? Can you tell me a bit more about it? <laughs> even my yeah. own parents who are in their 60s now have gone vegan. They did veganuary. Oh, wow. in, yeah, it was just in January they did veganuary. Um, I've kind of been gently pushing them over the last few years, not being anything too extreme. Um, and then my father told me that he'd gone vegan and I laughed. I thought, you're, you're joking, this is a joke, right? Um, oh. And he said, no, he said, I'm so vegan, I talk to the ants. <laughs> wow, that's, that's and, great. Yeah, and he's, he's even started his own vegan yogurt company really wow all, all in the space of like four months um and he's so passionate about it he's proper level 10 vegan you know hi i'm colin i'm a vegan kind of person <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great yeah so uh, it does give me hope for the future because if my father this steak eating farmer um can go vegan anyone can <laughs> Uh, apparently, there's a there's another film by um, it's called Seventy Three Cows by mm-hmm. Alex Lockwood, who's mm-hmm. also screening at Rain Dance, which is um, the story of a farmer who um, sent all his cows to Hillside Sanctuary and mm-hmm. then turned his farm into an organic vegan organic farm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time. I'm super excited to see this film here in the UK. Yeah, and the film's going to be available in the UK on iTunes and Amazon um around november i think so amazing how can people get in touch with you and follow you on twitter instagram etc the website is theendofmeat.com and um on facebook we're on facebook instagram twitter and it's uh at uh, end of meat and the hash t- uh, the handle is no sorry the hashtag is end of meat and the handle is at the end of meat well thank you so much for your time uh, it was really great to talk to you Thanks so much for having me. I'll be putting links uh, from the conversation in the description. 
If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up and please do subscribe to more plant-based news. Thanks very much.